Well, good afternoon. Uh, I will start by acknowledging that the land we are gathered on today is Treaty 6 territory, traditional meeting ground for many Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, uh, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis and Nakota Sioux people. Uh, I would also like to welcome, uh, well, welcome everybody, but in particular recognise our uh, board members. Um, so the board members we have here today are Mike Wade, our chair. Uh, we have Ranbir Bali from the Graduate Students Association. Uh, we have Deb Hemmeling. Do we have Deb Hemmeling here? Not yet. She's coming. And uh, Jonathan Strand. Yep. Hi, Jonathan. And are there any other board members here that I have missed? Okay. We also have um, some members of board committees. Uh, John Atchison. John's here. Welcome, John. Penny O'Mell, are you here, Penny? Anywhere? Not yet. And Georgette, is Georgette Reed here? Hi, Georgette. Hi. Um, before I, I do my introduction, please remember there are the My Q Story um, sheets of paper at the front, and I think you were given them as you walked in. Please, uh, over the next couple of weeks, uh, write your Q Story and post it to the board there and, and we'll collect those and uh, they'll be very interesting. I think we'll distribute them somehow. Um, now as President and Vice Chancellor of Concordia University of Edmonton, it's my pleasure to welcome you to what is becoming an annual uh, tradition of a board town hall. And the town hall today is comprised of three parts. First, uh, Todd Babiak from Story Engine will present what we are loosely calling our master story. Uh, Todd collaborated with the office of our Vice President, Academic and Provost to produce what I think you'll find is a really salient description of Concordia today. Now following Todd, I'll speak for a few minutes on where our academic plan might go based on this master story. And then following that, uh, members of our board will uh, come up on stage along with Todd and myself and we'll take questions both on the master story or, or my piece on, on where I see our academic plan going or anything else that you would like to ask of, of the board. Um, it's a wide open uh, question and answer period. So for now, it's my pleasure to introduce Todd Babiak from Story Engine. Todd's a well-known uh, former Edmonton journalist, mostly former. Um, I think you write on the interwebs and things. Does that count now? Um, he's the author of some terrific fiction novels, and now he's a strategist who focuses on post-secondary education. So, Todd, welcome to Concordia, and uh, we look forward to your unveiling of our new master story. So, people kind, please make Todd feel welcome. <laughs> We know what uh, universities are, generally, and when we choose a university, they're, they're sort of all the same. They all say the same things. And I think we struggle sometimes when we talk about the university that we've chosen, and we're forced sometimes to use the universal synonyms of post-secondary goodness, and these are collaborative, innovative, etc. You know the words. And uh, we're not alone. Every university in North America and Western Europe generally plays the same game. And it's very difficult not only to be an ambassador for your school or to choose a school, but then how do you actually, as someone who's part of an administration or you're a professor or you're an involved student, how do you reinforce that school at its best? When we began looking at uh, Concordia, we wanted to start answer the, answering these questions, not what's your story without giving you any context, but what is this place at its best? What can only happen here? Uh, what from the past of this place can we bring into the future? What are you most proud of? Uh, these are the kinds of questions we were most interested in and we were loving the stories that we heard from so many of you. Uh, this is uh, a piece of art that I've created. I think it's pretty great. Uh, you heard the word story a couple of times and uh, this is, many of us learned this in grade nine in some fashion. Uh, this is what a story arc is. There's always a setting, there's always a problem to solve, there's an inciting incident. Um, and this is uh, truly, I think, what all stories are. I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but 
At the, very, at the very end there, you see the word vision. Often we go straight to that. And those are those universal synonyms that we talk about. To let you know what I mean by story and how you can use it for strategy, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the place we're situated in, the city we're situated in. Uh, we did a similar work in Edmonton where we began interviewing people one by one. Uh, not groups like this where I would somehow ask you to tell me why you've chosen Edmonton or chosen Concordia. Because what you'll do is you'll try to impress one another and you'll use those universal synonyms. And Edmonton will then feel like every other place. But when you get people one-on-one, -on -one, they'll talk about well, they're most proud of, say, PCL and how it began. The Poole family that came here in the late 1920s and started this company, made it through the Depression because people helped them. And now, when you see those towers around Canada, you're so proud. It's an employee-owned Edmonton company. That's so Edmonton. Or how we, we created the first mosque in Canada here in Edmonton. A few Muslim women and uh, a mayor, Ukrainian contractor, Christian and Jewish fundraisers. That's so Edmonton or how we invented the food bank. That's so Edmonton, we came together. Uh, how the Fringe Festival in 1982, we filled all those empty, sad buildings in Old Strathcona with theater. It only takes $200 to put on a show in Edmonton. We invented a new way to do Fringe Theater and invented a North American model. 850,000 people went last year, that's so Edmonton. We reinvented public schools. Three doctors quit their jobs with local investment, started a little video game company, and now it's the best in the world. And well, the avatars walk through Edmonton wild grasses to kill the dragons. Uh, we invented a new model for community leagues. That's so Edmonton. And uh, when we spoke to indigenous Edmontonians, they said, none of this that you're hearing is new to us. This has been a gathering place for centuries. For over a thousand years, people have come here to trade and, and prosper. And uh, we were pleased to hear that. And when we, when we heard the story again and again in so many different ways, we thought, how do you bring a story to life? You have to tell the story. You could put it up on billboards. How about form meets content? And we ask Edmontonians to do what they've always done at their best. And so that's, if you've heard the phrase, make something Edmonton, that was the way that we told the story and made it strategy, a community-oriented strategy in the beginning. And uh, great big things came out of it and small things too. Uh, we asked Edmontonians to go uh, post on makesomethingemton.ca what they're working on and how we can help them. Uh, some of it was, was whimsical, let's put down some old pianos in public places, which is fun, that's certainly fun. But then uh, one day this man was, was playing a song of his own composition, a woman took a video of it, and it went viral around the world. And this is what, when Edmontonians said, what do we say about our city? This is what we want them to say, that something kind of extraordinary can happen in this place. And a story like this, when it travels around the world and, and ends happily in Edmonton, with this man getting a roof over his head and being invited to play for the Italian Prime Minister, this is a way to talk about what makes Edmonton, Edmonton. And we came up with a, a shorter version of a story that we can all tell. And this was the Edmonton version of it. And like every other institution in this city, you fit into this. You're a part of this. And we heard, as we often do in Edmonton when we do work, we heard variations of this about Concordia. How do you create strategy of it? This itself, this was the website. Uh, people are putting things up on the sides of buildings. Uh, you actually start creating a cohesive tourism campaign where we know who our audience is. We don't speak to everyone. We're not festival city. Really, we're fringe city. That's what makes Edmonton, Edmonton. Uh, economic development changes. The way we speak about the city changes and the way we develop our policies begin to change as well. And then we, we know how to be ambassadors, ideally. There are seven plots, as I was hinting at earlier, and the Edmonton plot, the thing we heard again and again, was something like rags to riches. Edmonton is sort of a Cinderella, ugly duckling town, and uh, we were pleased to see that plot happen again and again, and one of these is what we kept hearing when we were hearing about Concordia as well. Uh, you've heard this phrase. Uh, who, who likes to, to say that this is Canada's preeminent small university? Your boss. Uh, <laughs> And he's not wrong, but, but how? This is what we were most interested in. And again, the, in the ordinary university, students move from lecture theater to massive hall, and, and scientists stay with scientists, <laughs> philosophers with philosophers, and marketers share ideas with other marketers. But Concordia University of Edmonton was born to be different. For almost 100 years, our students came together through a shared belief despite varied interests and fascinations. 
their majors, and their minors. It created a unique culture where we could learn and create with anyone. Now, Q is no longer a faith-based campus, but re it remains a gathering place, a place of spirit, no matter what drives us. At Q, we apply what we learn in and out of our formal programs of study, working together to solve problems on campus and beyond. We earn a broad education intellectually and emotionally, even as we specialize. We live and work on a small campus, a river valley oasis, even in the wintertime. But this is our workshop. Q is a boutique university, small enough that every student is essential, yet large enough for a global outlook. In and out of our classrooms and lecture halls, we translate what we learn into extraordinary, hands-on experiences. We can sit in the back of the room, like in every other university, but at Q, someone will always invite us to the front. You heard that again and again. And if we are scientists, we can follow our curiosity into drama. A business student can graduate with a foundation in history, philosophy, and indigenous knowledge. We can learn new languages and traditions. We can test our ideas with people from every department and course of study from around the world. We can try anything here. We can change directions. We can be our best selves. An example, at Q, a center of innovation blends science and business with the liberal arts and indigenous studies. At Q, the feisty president might sit down at our table in the Tegler Center with coffee and ask us why we chose this school, how it could be even better. The provost might chat with us at the legendary tire swing. The close friends we meet at Q, the friends we remain with our entire lives could be from five different faculties and five countries. We're constantly seeking the right balance between teaching and research, between specialization and adventurousness, but our ultimate goal has not changed since 1921 to be more than students and professors, to create a community of active citizens of good and honorable people. That's what you told us in many, many interviews. We took all of the examples and distilled it down to what I just read for you, and you can find a copy of it even online now. Uh, but when we think about Concordia, when we think about Concordia in about 400 words, that's about it. Now, what do we do with it? There are some themes that came out of this, certainly, and, and people liked, you like to talk about the past. And more than that, you like to talk about what the past means today and in the future. Uh, it's where we come from, and it's where we fit in the constellation of other schools. And a place of faith is always going to be a place of spirit. And that's an old story and a fairly new story. And it's always been a place we can get a high quality education. But talking about high quality education is what everyone does. But the shared past is something that you wanted to talk about constantly. What does it mean? Another, a bridge into that is this definition of ethical that you brought up again and again, uh, a bridge from the past into the future. There's a Concordia definition of ethical, and it's about openness and humility and curiosity. And that line, good and honorable people, is a way that uh, we tried to, to distill that, what we heard from you, uh, in a world that sometimes feels like it has a shortage of them, certainly. It's a special thing here. This notion of character, the institution itself, and also the people it attracts, I, I wanted to say, in many ways, multidisciplinary. Uh, is something that came out in all of our conversations, which, as I said, goes back a long way. If you come here for a shared faith, with all of your different interests, you're coming together and colliding with people who you might not see at a normal university. You are a curious bunch of people, and you're not terribly interested in traditional boundaries. And you're willing to try something new as professors, as administrators, and as students. And I have to say, working with lots of organizations, this is something that I was delighted by again and again. Uh, the world demands, I guess, soft skills from us, maybe more than ever. And this is a place, no matter what you're focusing on, where you're going to find it. Uh, I won't name names necessarily, unless uh, the person puts up his hand and lets me. But uh, I really think about one of my favorite moments was speaking to one of your deans, who was formerly uh, involved in a law firm, who, after asking... <laughs> I didn't mean for that to be funny, sorry. Uh, but 
every year they would they would have uh, young people come in to to do a, a year of articling, and it was tough competition. So they would get down to the top five, and they would have a dinner, and these this top five students would come in, and the three or four partners would have dinner, and without the students knowing it, evaluate them, judge them, and what. Uh, what this person told me is they were most interested in, not in the people who went there almost reading off notes, talking about how much they love the law. What they wanted were well-rounded people, people who they thought they'd want to work with, and who could work with clients, who could build a business. And this gets really outside the traditional idea of a classroom. And his point in telling me this story was, I think we're good at that. And that really fits with character. Our place is unique. I talked about Edmonton, obviously, in the workshop aspect here, but the traditional meeting place of Indigenous people is crucial to Q uh, and who you are. And so are international programs being uh, open to the world, the invitation to the globe. Uh, the Edmonton story, as I said, is our story here. And we can do a lot more to bring that to life, to affect Edmonton. And in almost every interview, people said, we want to be we want to do more of that. We want what we're doing here to change our city because I think it's quite special and I think we can start taking on challenges based on what we're doing here as students. And then I, I think if I was to look at those plots, I think the plot that you're most in right now is sort of the renaissance rebirth or reinvention plot. You've come a long way and you're at this moment where so much is changing and it's, it's terribly exciting and you're so open to it which is unique. I have to say uh, doing this work, often someone will hire, an organization will hire us and what they want is, okay, explain to the world how we've always been awesome and just right now we want to be incrementally more awesome, and which never works and we usually have to uh, say no to that, but this is not what you're doing here. You are open to an absolute transformation, understanding what the rest of the post-secondary world is offering and what this place, what makes this place special, its best self and what it can do into the future. So this notion of, of reinvention is uh, an incredibly important part of your story. What, what do we do with all of this? Ideally, it is central strategy. This is what we've been asked to create for you. When you make decisions, whether you're students, ambassadors, administrators, professors, can you go back to this so that what we are doing and saying reinforces who we are at our best? Whether that's learning outcomes, strategic plan, or what you're going to see in the near future here, an academic plan. Can we build on this so that what makes us unique, this boutique idea, uh, preeminent idea that we're building, it, it reinforces who we are. We're not making random decisions, which is the enemy of good strategy. So that is uh, what we came up with for your story. And, and I, I know you all have the sheet, what's the hashtag uh, Q story. I don't, want, I don't want you to start with a blank page. I want you to think about the story of the institution and some examples of who you are at your best. And it could be any of this. But try to focus your thinking. You can be far more creative in this wonderful box that is Concordia than let's think about post-secondary education in general or schools in general. Because what we've done here is I think we've made a particular, something unique and powerful. And can you think of your story as an example of that? Uh, both for today and then in the future as you build your, if your students, a wonderful alumni network that is going to sustain you for the rest of your lives. Thank you for a wonderful opportunity to be a part of this school. I, I have to say I'm one of those people who, awful, damn me, uh, for a long time when I heard the name, the word, I'm a Concordia of Montreal graduate. <laughs> one problem. Uh, the second problem, I thought it was kind of a high school third problem much later than it was. I thought it was a faith-based institution. So three things that I, kind of a well-read Edmontonian, got wrong. And uh, I'm so excited about uh, this moment you're at as you redefine yourselves and go out into the world with, uh, with a powerful story. So thank you all for being involved, and I think you're going to have an opportunity to ask us questions pretty soon. Thank you, Todd. That was uh, terrific. Now, I'm going to do something I've never done before. That's something called a Pecha Kucha. It's 20 slides in 20 seconds per slide. 
So in six minutes, 40 seconds, I'll be done. We'll see if I can keep up with it. But it's probably, you know, as a general rule, it's not a great idea to practice things for the first time in a kind of big public <laughs> presentation. But um, let's just see how, <laughs> how that goes. So. Tim. Tim. Oh, I threw it there oh. on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I think, what cool Part people do. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Throw the cards. Yeah. Yes, that's the translation. So we just heard the master story uh, developed uh, by the office of our VPA and provost and uh, Todd Babiak from Story Engine. Now, uh, many of you have attended group and individual consultations on this, and I believe that this final version is a really accurate representation of who Concordia is today. So the master story is important because we need a baseline. We need a jumping off point uh, to inform the development of our new five-year academic plan. You know, we're about to embark on that, or actually, Valerie would say she's in the middle of it. So we need to understand and more or less agree on who we are before we can move on to who we could be. Now, our prior academic plan uh, has expired and lacks relevance, to be honest. Uh, it's time to put the old plan to bed and to move boldly forward. So aside from acting as a baseline, the various consultations that occurred as part of the master story process have provided us with a path, with some information that we can use to putting together a new draft academic plan. Now as we make the plan, further stakeholder consultation of course will be important. So the office of the VPA and Provost, Valerie's office, will put together a draft plan for discussion and input from our community. Uh, GFC will be charged with approving the final plan and hopefully this can all be done by early summer. Um, now the various discussions to date around the master story and our identity have helped us discern some potential future directions. We know we want to be Canada's preeminent small university. We must define this and we must identify metrics and indicators that will provide us with a destination uh, and to help us along the way. So the academic plan must lead us to preeminence. Otherwise, what have I been talking about for a year? While the VPA and Provost is taking charge of developing the plan, leadership from me as president is also important. So given that we are now an outcomes-based institution, I'll phrase some of my thoughts and directions that we could take in terms of outcomes, and in no particular order. And these really arise from our master story. So the first one is that students leave Concordia Prime for success. So our programs need to be relevant and sensitive to career preparation and producing good and honourable citizens. Uh, some students will go on to further study and those who do must leave with the intellectual tools they need to succeed. Outcome two is that students are highly satisfied with their Concordia education. They'll experience rigour and are challenged in the classroom while also enjoying activities and the environment outside of the classroom. So I'm thinking of drama, music, athletics, all of the various CSA activities that go on. Now, outcome three is that we are welcoming and inclusive. Uh, we've made many changes already towards being a more inclusive institution, but the work is not yet done, and we need to challenge ourselves on this matter always. Uh, I would like to see us as Canada's most welcoming campus. I think that's part of being preeminent. Outcome number four is that Concordia produces substantial, high-quality research. Now, faculty should work collaboratively. There's a word for you, Todd. You can use that in some of your future work, uh, including with students. Uh, I love our research clusters. They're a great example of this. But also widely accepted research metrics, such as grant uh, success, uh, publications, must be attended to as well. We can't ignore those. Now, outcome five is that Concordia is connected to Edmonton, Canada, and the world. Our outreach is terribly important, be it through our CIAR or through our Erasmus Plus experiences and other international exchange opportunities. We can't be anonymous, and this helps us to have a profile elsewhere. Outcome six is that we are sustainable in the long term. Now, I'm told a business model in a university are like oil and water. They don't mix. But the reality is that we must be lean and efficient if we are to remain viable, because without this, nothing else is possible. Outcome seven is about being innovative. <laughs> we must continue, and what I mean by that is that we must continue to adapt 
improve and change our existing programs. We must also develop opportunities for new programs that we know will flourish uh, and offer them in ways that distinguish us from other places, the competition, so to speak. Outcome eight is that we are a strong community. Our students love that everyone knows their name here at Concordia and they have friends across programs. We're a community that cares for one another and we need to stay that way. That sense of community should span from their first day on campus till life as an alum later on. Outcome nine is that we've developed a reputation for being Canada's preeminent small university. So think of the best small university in Canada. If it's not Concordia, is it somewhere like St. FX? So when people across the country are thinking about the best small university, the most preeminent small university in Canada, it's Concordia that comes to mind. Now I suspect that these nine outcomes will be somehow reflected in the academic plan. They might be phrased differently, they might be separated out or combined, but given what we know today, I'd be surprised if we did not feel the need to address these areas. Of course, ultimately our community will decide where we are headed. Now Concordia is on the cusp of something special and we need an academic plan that allows us to be open to seizing new opportunities and adapting to the circumstances. It must hold on to what is great about us now while at the same time not being anchored to redundant ways of doing things. This is one of the most exciting times in our history to be at Concordia. So a guiding question I think that will never set us on the wrong path is what is best for our students? Uh, we, have, we have a decision to make. When we have a decision to make, we'll take the one that is best for our students. As we construct our new academic plan, this is something I think we need to keep in mind. Leaving other agendas aside, what is best for our students? Now, in closing, and with reference to the nine outcomes I've discussed here today, in my view, at least for the moment, being Canada's preeminent small university means that our students are highly satisfied while they're here and successful when they graduate. Our research is powerful and substantial. Our community is welcoming, inclusive and strong. And we are connected to Edmonton, Canada and the world. We are sustainable and we approach our work with innovation and flair. If we can do all of what I just said, we can truly be thought of as Canada's preeminent small university. And our reputation will grow both across the country and across the world. And I did it. <laughs> So now, thank you. So now I'd like to ask uh, Mike Wade and uh, Ranbir Bali up, up on stage to join us, and uh, Todd as well, and we'll get some chairs out and we'll take questions. So they can be questions on the master story, questions on the piece I just did, or any other question that, that you may have. And do we have a microphone for, yeah, so Lana has a microphone and Jill has a microphone as well. So if you, if you would like to ask a question, put up your hand and they will, I guess they will pick. Will you pick or do you want me to pick? I, I'll pick. And this is for us. Thanks. Questions? Always this way. You need one or two people to plant. You need to plant them. Yes. Yes. Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. This is, could have been a little embarrassing standing up here for half an hour. So one of the tensions with being inclusive is when we get controversial speakers um, to campus or controversial groups. This is not really a question. It's more of a statement. It's something we have to contend with. If we're inclusive, how do we exclude people who are more detrimental to the campus rather than um, productive and building it up? Do you want me to field it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I, can, I can field it. Great, great, excellent question, Andrew. Thank you. Um, so this is something that uh, has been, of course, in the media, especially over the last year, where they've had, especially in the US, um, certain speakers at Berkeley and other places that have caused riots and, and uh, security issues. And, and I heard of one speaker at one university, I think the, the security bill was $600,000 or something like that for, for that person to come. So we've decided to be uh, uh, proactive in that regard, not reactive in developing a policy. Uh, at the moment it's a draft policy, but it's 
almost fully complete, is, is my understanding, uh, on, on campus speakers. So we've tried to look at um, the, the balance between protecting uh, free speech issues and also uh, set the safety and security of people on our campus and not running up, not being responsible for uh, security bills that are kind of through the roof, which would be an area that you would, uh, I think, be interested in. Um, and uh, what, what we have is, is a process by which um, not just any, anyone can't just come and book a room and speak at Concordia. Um, you have to have some affiliation with the institution. So you have to be uh, invited by, by someone here to speak or a group or a, 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 you know, a, a person to come and speak. If there's a potential for that uh, topic to be controversial, we do have the, the policy asked for a committee to review uh, and make some decisions around uh, how, that, how we can have that talk, if we decide to have that talk, in a, um, a sort of civilised manner, not, not uh, a big free fall with hundreds of protesters outside. So I think for, uh, for us and for all universities are looking at this issue and, and it's really about striking a balance. I think that, 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 that policy should be finished uh, probably within a couple of months, I'd say. Have we had any speakers that have been controversial? No. We've had, uh, Todd Babby, we had Todd Babby at <laughs> once. <laughs> we haven't, but we've had uninvited uh, people come to campus before to distribute material which was not uh, authorised at all. Yes. That's an example. Yeah, so, so they could be asked to... So is that, is that more of a trespassing issue, a security yeah, issue? Yeah, but that's more of a security issue. I mean, unless, unless someone has gone through the correct process, um, they, I think we'd be well within our rights to ask them to please leave. <laughs> so I, I can't really see very well here, is it? Yeah, Dan, Dan. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey. Thanks. I want to thank you for great presentation and, and telling the story today and uh, wonderful story it's very inspiring and uh, my question is how do we share this story more broadly so that we do change that perception of Concordia as the the Concordia Montreal or the the faith-based or the you know to, to shift that public perception do you want to take do you have any well, anyway, Todd can start and then. Uh, the traditional way to do it, I think, and uh, is is through publicity and advertising, but that's very expensive, and you probably don't have the budget to get on a Super Bowl. But I think uh, step one is making ambassadors of all of you and all of your colleagues and the rest of the students. If if this is something that in your way you can begin to carry, that's step one begin to do something about it. One of the examples we heard was, Edmonton doesn't have a bike share program. I wonder if, uh, if one of our end of the year projects could be, we, we invent that for Edmonton. We start it here, we take it to the city, and uh, this would be free publicity. Every, all the media would, would talk to you. There'd be an opportunity for, for Tim, for students, for the for the project uh, team to talk about, well, this is us, this is the sort of thing we do, we think this town's our workshop, it's always been like, you know, you see how that begins to work. And if you, if you begin to act your story, uh, act in the way that it's, that it's true, it begins over time, and this is hard, long work, over time to, to do its job. And you are entering an anniversary soon. You do have an opportunity to make a bit of a splash, some of the people, and again, this is not something that I've heard anything official about, but a lot of people pointed out the, um, the hoarding, construction hoarding in the, in the logo, Concordia was smaller than University of Edmonton. Uh, is it time to change the name to University of Edmonton? People brought that up because for them it was a way to, all right, let's, let's reinvent ourselves. When people ask, why have you changed your name? We have a good answer. And uh, so that's another way, just ways people talked about. If you notice, Tim and I use some of the same pictures. You need to, to have someone go out with a, photo, with a camera all year, not just in the summertime, taking pictures of people doing things. Uh, so you need a really big bank of, of photographs to share and, and so that you yourselves can share them online. 
Uh, so you do all of that yourself, and then you also, I think, you have you have a marketing agency who can take all of this, take the story, and tactically create a plan. So those are those are some of the things. And again, if your academic plan, your strategic plan, everything Tim says and does, and everything you say and do, uh, tell the story. Over time, it just does its own work. I'm I'm a huge fan of the master story, and and I was lucky enough with Valerie and and Todd when he had the draft together. I mean, I, I saw it in its various forms as it got distilled down to what it is and one of the, the things I really like about it is how succinct it is. It's, what is it, three quarters of a page and it's not heavy tech. So I think it's something that our whole community is able to kind of remember and articulate uh, even if not in the exact same words, although it's written so beautifully that those words stick in your mind. You know, the, you wrote it. Yeah, you wrote it. <laughs> so, um, Yeah, I, I think uh, you know Todd is ex exactly right. We're all we're all ambassadors. It's, we've got a master story. It's it's how we interpret that and make it our own. Uh, I know from the board's perspective, one of the ways that we've uh, that we started to uh, I guess incorporate. And I, I know I, I recognize this is relatively new, but in terms of reaching out, uh, when I look at board recruitment, and you know, we've got a more uh, a more diverse and more uh, outreaching board than we've ever, than we've ever had, and uh, and so the, the the hope there is that continues and. Uh, but that comes from that comes from board members who are who are engaged, uh, just as faculty members and staff and students who are engaged in the community, in the institution, uh, the university, and uh, and making that their own. So so when we look at we ask our board members uh, uh, to participate, whether it's through fundraising or, or whatever, one of the areas is through recruiting new board members, and uh, and so we've got some fantastic new uh, new committee members on uh, now. We've got. Georgette Reed here is here, and, and John Atchison is here, and uh, so our hope, from a board perspective, is that uh, that engagement continues, and um, yeah, just as it would for for all of you, whether it's uh, faculty, staff, uh, students, or, um, or 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 even administrate, even administration. <laughs> um, I, I would like to add on to this story. Like, it was a right. great experience. Sorry. It was a great experience to share a story with Cambodia and. <laughs> with uh, what experience we have here. Uh, involving students is very important. Like, you need to know the view of students, what they are thinking, or what they want from the, stu from the association, or what they want from the institution. What are their views for the ahead, uh, for the future of this institution? And like, for one of the best thing uh, about this story is that we are, in, uh, we are innovating and we are way ahead to CIAR, which is a, a applied research institute. So how we get feedback from all the students, how what they are thinking that how we are heading towards the research. So involvement of students is very important in that and all other people who are uh, who just share that story in their Facebook, all other marketing places where they, where, all other uh, social media where they are involved. So that would be the great thing, how we can just Share the story more and more. Yes. Um, I guess I'm interested. Hi. Um, how did the interview process work? How far back did you go? How far back? You yeah. Mean the individuals we spoke to? Yeah, as far as, as the historic perspectives. There's still a few of us oldies that are around. And I guess, I'm, and there's a lot of confusion right now among the old alumni as to what Concordia is now, where it's going. I mean, I have a good friend from when we were here in the 50s, and he's decided that he's not going to put Concordia in his will now because he's going to take it out because he's all confused about where it's going. So I guess, I mean, did you go back to those people as well? Yeah, we did. We had a, a large list and we spoke to some uh, older alumni, I suppose, and we spoke to some professors who've been here quite a long time. Yeah. And I don't think, uh, I think you're correct, we did hear confusion. Yeah. And I think what we heard ultimately was that this is, this is an opportunity. This isn't something <coughs> negative at all. Uh, everything has to change and there's a, there's a real moment here for this special place to redefine itself without giving up on its past in any way. Yeah. 
No one said that. I, I didn't speak to anyone who said, let's just forget all about all that stuff. No, there's a way to bridge the past into the present. So uh, I, I think if we can speak to your friend, uh, I think we can convince him or her that uh, this is still that place he or she loves and uh, Concordia belongs in the will. <laughs> I mean, it, it's an interesting thing. There's, there's a group of us that considered ourselves part of the golden days of Concordia. And this was basically, it was a high school was one year, two years at most of, of university level. And those were all, you know, pre-seminary people. Um, and we still get together. I mean, we're going on a cruise in the fall. Um, the ones that of us are still living and above ground. Um, you know, it, it's, um, it's an unusual group because we still have stuck together. And when we were here, there were only 125 students. So we became very, very close family. And I just was together with them last week for Elsie's 75th birthday. And it was basically no one, none of us had heard that this was happening. And I'm not sure why, you know. Well, there's certainly a reach out component there, but What's interesting about what you just said is recent graduates and current students say exactly what you just said about what makes this place special and how they're creating lifelong friends. And they do feel that it might not have been possible in another, a different kind of campus, that's one thing. The other is that when people spoke of rituals that maybe you grew up with here, for example, the yearly dinner that, that I heard a lot about, can we bring that back in a modern form? So can we take... Uh, historical Concordia rituals and traditions and, and bring them into the modern era in some fashion. Some of them you sure don't want. <laughs> right, <laughs> only the good ones. Hi there, Penny O'Mell, I'm a new committee member. Thank you very much. Hi, Penny. Um, listening to the story and from what I know, I think you have a unique opportunity to collaborate with various organizations in Edmonton in a way that our current third level institutions don't do. And I'm sure it's embedded in some of this vision work, but I just offer that up to you. I think there would be a number of organizations, agencies that would love to be part of the Concordia story, whether it's practicum students, whether it's input to faculty about the outcomes that we need to see in the work, whatever it might be. So I just offer that up to you as an idea. I, I mean, I, I guess I can comment on that. Um, yeah, we've been really over the last year, especially a year and a half, probably more accurately, trying to really re-engage with the community. And part of this is through, as Ranby mentioned, our uh, Centre for Innovation and Applied Research, whose mandate it is to reach out and, and form, help us form partnerships and help us to connect. But this new building that we're having is also another uh, a piece that's enabling us to reach out to people as, as there's so many parts of that building and so there's so many opportunities for our community be, to become involved that um, it's really enlivened that side of things and you know um, on one hand there's the, a cynical sort of we're just trying to raise funds for the new building aspect but uh, on the other hand and more truthfully it's really about trying to forge some long-term partnerships with people so that the work uh, at Concordia can be progressed uh, beyond the next couple of years, you know, so that's what we're trying to do. Are there any, uh, any other one? Yeah. yeah, I would just say, just to reiterate my uh, <clears throat> earlier comment about, about from, from, from the board's uh, side of things, and I think when you look at uh, some of the new board members uh, reaching out, some of the uh, relationships that are in place, uh, Tim and I and other board members have had some real interesting uh, conversation with both industry and other potential partners over the last six months and all of those uh, were the result of, of introductions that were made by, by board members who have um, uh, very um, extensive or interesting uh, um, you know, connections into the community. So I think that uh, uh, that will continue and I know it will continue. Uh, and just want to just comment from your, your earlier question, uh, this, this uh, woman here. Uh, it, it, the, bo the board is very uh, aware of, of uh, our history and heritage, and, and uh, believe me, it comes up on a regular basis. I'm not going to say every meeting, uh, but we are uh, constantly reminding ourselves and administration that uh, one of the defining characteristics of Concordia 
is our heritage. And, um, and we, when we look at that as a very positive thing. And so I would, I would uh, never want um, an alumnus uh, or a former employee or staff member, a fac former faculty member, to ever think that we're um, somehow disrespecting our history or our heritage, uh, because that is, uh, that is absolutely um, top of mind. And, uh, and it's, it's our hope that, uh, you know, I know we've talked about different ways to, uh, uh, you know, to engage alumni, alumni and, and uh, we, we're, you know, even in, even in recruiting board members, we're conscious of the fact that we want to, we want to make sure we've got, um, uh, you know, different, different uh, alumni on there. And uh, so it's, it's top of mind. Um, and so I just want you to know that, that that's at our, it's a, we're thinking about it as well. John. The term uh, faith-based was used uh, by uh, uh, Todd and, and Tim yourself. Is it possible, I think it might be possible, to have a faith-based institution at the same time as a secular institution? So how, how would, what do you see, how, how would that work? It's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know, but I, I thought of it when the term was used, and it's it kind of is a fascinating question that I have. I mess on myself. Can well, you have both? Yeah, I mean, it may, maybe it would be helpful to, to um, you know maybe give some some of the background here. And, and Tim, you can you were part of this, so you can jump in. But part of some of the background, as many of you know, uh, you know, Concordia was a um, uh, was a, a member of the Lutheran Church of Canada. It was a Lutheran based institute, uh, university, high school university. And, um, and then over the years, that, that, um, there, there became a separation there. And so when we talk about it, so now Concordia is really, I think, one of Canada's only secular independent institutions. So, so we, uh, independent meaning that, um, that we uh, select our own board. There's, there's uh, minimal government involvement in terms of, in terms of governments, governance. So we have our own, our own uh, bylaws. And, and, and even though we are governed under the Post-Secondary Learning Act, or we abide by the PSLA, we still set our own rules. So we're secular in the sense that we don't have a formal um, uh, tie to any specific um, uh, faith. Uh, having said that, we have a, uh, a multi-faith chapel. So there is a, uh, I don't know if you use the word chapel, but a multi-faith prayer room uh, in the school. So there is, there is still, uh, there is still that, that ability. We also have um, a department of, uh, uh, is it a department of Christian studies or religious studies? Or? A philosophy and religious studies. Pardon me? Philosophy and religious studies. Philosophy and religious studies. So there's quite an active, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Professor Bill Anderson's here, and uh, he puts, every year he puts on a, um, uh, on a, on a conference uh, that's centered around religious studies, uh, specifically, um, you know, sort of a Christian focus. Uh, so there is, so it's not, so we're not, we are a secular institution because we don't have a formal tie to a faith. We receive no money from, from specific faiths, but we are very respectful of faiths. And, uh, and if you note that uh, many times when we start our um, start uh, 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 an event, if we've got um, indigenous people with us, we will uh, oftentimes have uh, an indigenous uh, 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 ceremony, uh, faith ceremony. So, so I, I, don't, I wouldn't uh, so I wouldn't say that we're necessarily. Uh, uh, I think the way I would phrase it is that we are respectful of faiths, of all faiths. We're, we're trying to be inclusive of faiths as opposed to. Uh, um, you know, specifically uh, one specific faith. Does that, does that help? Good answer, thank you very much. John, when I, uh, there's a line in the story that came out of my interview with Louis Cardinal, and the line is, uh, place of spirit, because he himself said uh, this, this uh, Christian heritage is, is true, and it goes farther back, uh, this, this special land we're on and, and the special mission we have, so that's, that's the line in the story, so it certainly doesn't go away. I, I would just add, John, I think um, for the future though in terms of could we be faith-based and, and secular at the same time, I think with respect to that, the egg is scrambled and it can't be unscrambled. I mean, we have moved sort of, it, it was a difficult uh, period in our history and we've kind of moved beyond that now. Um, to a point where, as as Mike, you know, put it very, he put it very well, that that now we're inclusive of all faiths, um, and and so I don't think I I couldn't imagine us running back into the arms of any 
one single church or even denomination at this point. Um, but that said, um, we want to um, encourage and support people who um, are interested in, in expressing their faith uh, here at Concordia. And the multi-faith prayer room is an example of that. We have a, a Christian a students' union who um, we try and support as much as we can. And so, um, you know, we, it's that while the institute, there's no institutional position, so to speak, on faith, um, we do support the various groups within the institution who are interested in um, engaging with their own faith. Thank you. Or no faith. <coughs> no more questions? Last time we had somebody say that they wish there was time for more questions. <laughs> Well, I'll ask another one. Sure. Okay. Um, you talked about our students uh, preparing them for success. Just a very brief discussion with Todd before uh, uh, the program today. Um, we talked about how things are going to change and change so rapidly. So we're going to educate uh, students to graduate in 2018, yeah. for jobs and so on that uh, they'll be prepared to take. But literally, in five years, they won't exist. Ten years, they won't exist because of the exponential change that's taking place. How do we, how do we prepare our, our students for uh, a world that doesn't exist yet, but it's going to exist very, very shortly into their careers? Uh, I'm always a little bit skeptical about of futurists who say, you know, our, our, the jobs of the future will be here, there, and everywhere, because I don't think they have a crystal ball that's any better than anyone else's crystal ball. I mean, my, my feeling is that a, a solid, broad education, for example, in the liberal arts, is exactly what is needed for students as they move into the future. Um, we're looking at a world where artificial intelligence, for example, is exponentially kind of taking over roles that previously we had lots of humans working on. Um, so what sort of an education do you need in a world where most of the decisions are made by something much quicker and, and with many more considerations than most humans can make? And in my opinion, it's, it's the liberal arts that helps uh, to support, will help to support careers, because humans are still going to have to be the decision makers. We're still going to have to understand the ethics of, of what we do. Uh, and the sort of citizenship required to, to operate in that sort of a world. So, and, and as far as that's concerned, Concordia is so strong in, in providing a very broad, very solid education to our students who come out. So I think we're exactly what the world needs in, in, in that terms, in those terms. Uh, I would just like to add on to this. Uh, I already stated the center of applied research that we are planning CIR is the best example to how to prepare students for the future. Like we have different research already going on in uh, computer science, our masters of information security, and those students who will get prepared in that background, they will be prepared for the future in PhDs in artificial intelligence, and that's the future. Like art, if you talk about the artificial intelligence, machines are going to be taken, taking parts of uh, parts where humans are now involved they are going to teach students, where students are going to be involved in every, where students can learn that how the machine, they can talk to machines and machines can able to uh, handle all the stuff and they can innovate that. So that's the great step, like uh, our, we are heading towards uh, artificial intelligence and uh, towards research where, like I see that in Edmonton then there is no center for, uh, there is no institute which gives a PhD degree in uh, artificial intelligence are, are just a master's in artificial intelligence. I am a student, of in, a student of information security. So I would like to talk about that, that we are also planning for BSc IT, which is a step for sporting masters of information security and moving ahead to PhD in artificial intelligence. So that will be I think, John, too, I used to teach in our faculty of education and, and uh, it was always important to remind uh, people, especially people who would uh, sometimes um, think that beginning teachers should have skills that, that more experienced teachers have. 
is that nobody comes out of university fully formed and that learning is really a lifelong exercise. So I think all of us um, have to recognise that no matter what career we're involved in, we're all going to have to go back to some form of education throughout our entire career. So, um, you know, the fact that we can't really predict what jobs necessarily are going to be required for the future, that's, I think, not as important as providing someone with, with a, a foundation and, and the capacity to engage in further learning as they, they move forward. The only thing I'd add on to that is, is, is Concordia is uniquely uh, positioned because of our independence and our, and our ability to, uh, to reach out <coughs> and look for industry partners. Um, I, I think we've got a, a real unique opportunity, unique amongst other uh, post-secondary institutions, uh, to, to find those industry partners. So when we look at uh, making sure that our programs are relevant and timely, uh, we, can, we, can, we can reach out and, and uh, we've, you know, Tim's working on a, on a project right now with a potential industry partner that's really exciting um, in developing some course curriculum. And uh, that wouldn't happen in a larger institution, but it can happen here because, because we have the relationships and because we can be reactive to the demand. So we're out of time, but I'd like to thank uh, Todd Babiak, I'd like to thank Ranbir Bali, and I'd like to thank Mike Wade for uh, their time today, and uh, I hope that you found this a worthwhile town hall. So thank you very much.